We have uh, gotten here at last, but we didn't know if we were going to get here. We didn't know in the beginning, uh, two or three days ago, whether we would. Um, we come from Chicago, you know, where they were having a very uh, heavy uh, snowstorm and getting ready on the, on the TV for uh, unexpected things to happen. And last year, one time, we were stormed in. We couldn't even get out of our house for two days. And uh, then some young people came over to the door, and, and uh, they got up there, as young people do, you know, and uh, rang the doorbell, and we looked, and they said, say, do you want us to shovel you out? <laughs> I, I said, uh, yes, how, how much will you do it for? <laughs> and uh, uh, they said, five dollars. I said, wonderful. But they did such a good work, I gave them ten. <laughs> they had one of these snow uh, blowers, and, it, and they, they did it too sweet, if you know what that means. <laughs> And uh, I should have gotten their names so that I could have phoned them in case we got buried again. <laughs> but uh, everything was all right. They were, they were tops. And uh, I think I'll do something a little di bit different uh, today. Masha doesn't know this. <laughs> but she, she's ready for almost anything that may happen. And, uh, but I'm, I'm warning her right now that maybe... Uh, Maybe we'll conduct this together <laughs> so that uh, she can have as much say about things as I do. And if she wants to add to what I'm talking about, that would be fine. So uh, we, we cooperate, we work together, and, uh, but we've never had a, uh, <laughs> a lecture period together like this in quite the same way. So I, I don't know how that will happen, but um, it's, it's all right. Yeah. What did I uh, ask you, Marsha, a few minutes ago, where that verse was? Yeah, and here it is. We receive from him whatever we ask because... Hmm. Have you any idea what that because means? Now, here, I use my imagination with this that uh, here are some people that come to John and say, tell us, why is it, how is it, that all your prayers are answered? Ours are not, but yours are. What's the secret? And he made uh, this statement. Why we risk, now that, that's my idea, you know. That's just my imagination. And, but this is what he said. We receive from him whatever we ask because, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. See? And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who keep his commandments abide in him, and he in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit which he has given us. Yeah. And uh, then the, the uh, scripture, I think I'll read this whole thing, although all of you know this, in, uh, in the Gospel of John. You can turn to it. You have different versions, so um, it's okay. The Gospel of John, verse fifth, uh, no, uh, chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that bears no fruit he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. He could have added, uh, and better fruit. <laughs> more and better. He prunes that it may bear more fruit. 
you are already made clean by the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. Isn't that a perfect, what, what do you say, analogy? Is that right? Perfect. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If a man does not abide in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. Sweeping promise, isn't it? Yeah. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be me, to prove to be my disciples. And our job is to prove it, isn't it? All the time. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Now that's one of the highest things that, that Jesus wants. That God expects of us to be joyful people. People filled with joy. Yeah. I think Jesus may have been the most joyful person that ever lived. And uh, most of the poets and artists have done him a, an injustice, not intentionally, and, uh, I, and I'm not criticizing them, but there is very seldom that you see a, a wonderful picture of Jesus. Uh, giving the effects of joy. A man filled with joy, overflowing with joy. We, sh we should uh, have more of that type of artistry. And uh, because that's what he wants us to be. But when you see pictures of the Savior, they're often pictures of, uh, of sorrow. And of course, that, that's true too. He bore our sins. He carried our sorrows <coughs> and all that. But we have slighted, and I think Christians in general have slighted the joyful aspect of the life of Jesus. And, uh, and so these things I have spoken to you so that you may be filled with joy, that my joy may be in you. See? and that your joy may be full. That's why he uh, said the things that he did, many of the things. Uh, when I was a child, I loved fairy stories. Most kids do, you know. And uh, one especially that I used to enjoy were the two, two uh, maiden, two women unmarried women, in England they'd call them spinsters, that uh, lived together. And, uh, and the fairy appeared in their midst and shook her little wand and uh, says, I'll, I'll give you uh, three wishes. And these two ladies uh, just looked in amazement and said, wonderful, what will we wish for? And uh, they couldn't think immediately on what to wish for, and so they asked the fairy 
if she wouldn't come back after supper. And that'll give them time to think it over. Because they wouldn't, they, they mustn't make a mistake on this. This was a chance of a lifetime. And so the fairies said, uh, okay. <laughs> Only they didn't talk like that in those days. <laughs> and uh, the fairy promised to come back after supper. And uh, so they started setting, setting the table. And uh, everything was all done except the dessert. And um, they wondered what they were going to have for dessert. And one of them said, my, I wish we had some apple pie. And zip, there was an apple pie right there on the table. And uh, oh my, uh, Ruth, you're a goose. You shouldn't have done that. You. You've wished for an apple pie. You've spent one of our wishes. And uh, then uh, there was only one thing left to do, and, and that was to, uh, and, and the pie jumped right up onto the nose of uh, the girl. And, uh, and then there was nothing left to do but to use the other wish to wish the pie off. <laughs> so they lost their three wishes. And uh, if you are going to wish for something, um, what would you wish for? Now, now, Jesus is not saying, I'll give you three wishes, nor 300 wishes, nor 3,000 wishes. He says, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. There's no limit. We forget some of these things. We have our problems and our burdens. And sometimes they get pretty acute. Domestic difficulties, financial trouble. And my, if we could find a way out of the difficulties that we are in. Now here is a law that Jesus pronounced. And uh, we can believe it and go all the way with Jesus. And I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to deal with that. If you abide in me, and that's the first condition, and the second condition, and if my words abide in you. You see, he is the vine, and we are the branches. The main thing is the vine. But if we're cut off from him, if we don't belong to him, or if we're not having fellowship with, if we're not living in him, so that the life of uh, the vine is coming right out into us, why then this doesn't apply to us. But it applies to the degree that we are living in him. I suppose it's to the degree, because none of us uh, live 100% in him, I suppose. I know I don't. But uh, we can, um, but the more we live in Christ, the more this first condition is met. He who abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Yeah. Now, uh, what are fruit bearers, do you suppose, in this respect? Those that uh, go around uh, criticizing everybody, finding fault with everything, snarling here and snarling there. Yeah. Marsha, what happened uh, in India one time when that um, uh, lady came to you and asked you that question? There are some Parsis in Bombay whom uh, we've become acquainted with, and, uh, and uh, she's even... Uh, Marsha wasn't with me on, on uh, this particular occasion, but she invited us into her home, and uh, we had an evening meal together. Uh, she and her husband and other relatives, and it was quite an interesting affair. Some of you don't know maybe what a Parsi is, but a Parsi is a, um, not a worshiper. They wouldn't call it that. We'd think of it as that, maybe. But... Uh, 
one whose prophet is, uh, is, uh, what's the name? Huh? Zoaster. Yeah. Zoaster. Zoaster. It begins with Z. Yeah. Zoaster. And uh, they, uh, she told me one time that they don't worship Zoaster, but he's our prophet, just like Jesus is your prophet. <laughs> but uh, she didn't know the half of it. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, they're interesting people. The uh, group began in uh, Persia and then migrated to India and they live in the Bombay area and uh, through the years as we've been going to India she's been to many of our meetings and uh, brought others with her and one time invited me to talk on prayer to the Parsis of Bombay and uh, she said that she would uh, rent a, uh, a lounge, a hall, in uh, a hotel in Bombay, and invite the people, get the people to come. And I said, but I can't talk on prayer without talking about Jesus. Oh, that doesn't matter. Uh, that, that won't offend them one bit, she said. And uh, so I said, well, with, with that understanding, why, I'll be happy to talk uh, to them about prayer. Be and what did she say to you, Marsha? She came and asked you some questions. Uh-huh. Go ahead, tell them. This wasn't a dedication, though. Oh, some other occasion. <laughs> well, it doesn't matter. It's the same woman. We were having a camp. Yeah, that doesn't down matter. Down at, uh, near Pune. Pune, India. Mm -hmm. in a new life center belonging to the Methodists there in uh, the Pune area of India. She was attending, yet she was a Parsi. We knew she was not Christian. She came to me, I've been leading meditation. She came to me and uh, she said, I've been taking notes on your meditations. I thought, well, that's interesting. Why she, would she want to take notes on my meditations? Then she said, because I have been doing some praying, leading the group, she said, and I've been taking notes on your prayers. Is that all right? And I thought, what would a Parsi woman want with a record of the prayers that I pray? Why take notes on that? And I thought, surely she's not going to take those notes and put a prayer together and try to duplicate my prayer from a Parsi background, I wondered why. Then she came another time and she said, uh, you know, you Christians love your Jesus. We Parsis love our prophet. I thought, fine, love is involved. And she said, another time, you, par you Christians love your Jesus. We Parsis love our prophet in the same way you love Jesus. And I thought, well, that's an improvement. In the same way. But I thought, how could they? In the same way. In the same spirit. Well, puzzled me. And she came again and she said, uh, you love your Jesus. I'm praying that our people, the Parsis, learn to love your Jesus. She was not meaning loving Jesus in the way in which we love Jesus as Messiah. She wasn't meaning that at all. But just loving him as a person, a prophet, someone who could teach them. And then the last time she spoke about it, she said, I'm praying that the Parsis learn to love your Jesus in the way in which you love Jesus. And I thought, wonderful. Because I don't know the end of that. It's a continuing story, and I haven't heard the end. I don't know whether that prayer has been answered or not. I kind of wonder. But she came again, and 
the statement she made the last time that she spoke about it has been with me ever since. And she was talking to me, and yet she was talking, as it were, to all Christians. I took it that way. She said, if being a Christian means being like Christians, I don't want to be a Christian. And everything within me said, ouch. If being a Christian means being like Christians, being like us, like us, like us all around the world, all of us who call ourselves by his name, if being a Christian means being like us, she didn't want to be a Christian. Because I could guess a little of, a few of the reasons why she might not want to be a Christian, if it meant being like us. Because some of us, and I'm including me, aren't all that we ought to be. If she'd only said, if being a Christian means being like Jesus. But she didn't. And what she was doing was throwing him out. Because of the way in which I live. Turning him down the one who could solve all their problems because of my failures to live the life. Yes, I said, ouch. And around this world, there are a lot of people who don't know him, who judge him because of the way in which we live. Mm. Ouch. Don't forget it. I can't forget it. Uh-huh. The, um, on another occasion, uh, when we were in India, there was a uh, news item that came out in the newspaper that someone was going to, to uh, present to uh, their uh, official governing board of the, of the nation, like our Congress, you know, in Washington, <coughs> Uh, a law making it illegal for any, any uh, promoting of Christianity or of getting anyone uh, to accept anything that is foreign to, to the Hindu language. They were Hindus, huh? the Hindu religion. And uh, so they, the missionaries came to Master and me and said, uh, well, what, what could we do if they pass such a law? That's what we're over here for, is to help Christianize them. And uh, then an idea came into my mind. I grinned <laughs> and, and said, why, well, rejoice and be exceeding glad because if you can't teach it, maybe you'll have to live it. And that's the main thing, folks. That's the main thing. People can listen to what you have to say to them about what uh, your religion or your church uh, or Jesus means to you. And you can do a pretty good job at it. But uh, they're, not, they're not listening to that quite so much as, uh, as they are to what kind of a person you are, how you're living the Christian life. And so... They turn Jesus down. But the, the point is that uh, um, we, must, we must live it. Now, now I'm going to the law. It, and the law is uh, verse, verse 7. This is gosp the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 7. And you all know it. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. Now that's a sweeping promise. 
He's not saying, I'll give you three wishes, nor 300 wishes, nor 3,000 wishes. There's no limit, no limit to what Jesus promises here. If you abide in me, two things, that's one of them. And the second is, and my words abide in you. Then ask whatever you will, and it shall be done for you. Now, what does he mean by those two, two fundamental ideas? If you abide in me, what is the idea of abiding? Well, he's just used the illustration for it, which is the illustration of the vine and the branches. And where the branches, he's the vine. <coughs> now, uh, at this time of the year, a little earlier maybe, uh, we go out into our orchard and, uh, and prune the trees. And when we get back uh, from this trip and maybe a little later on, uh, we'll also prune uh, our grapevine because that hasn't been pruned yet. But that pruning has to be done after the sap stops flowing, is that right? Yeah. And uh, so we have to wait until uh, the proper time, the season, in which you can prune. And uh, so sometimes there has to be a lot of pruning done in our own lives. And uh, you may go to church, you may hear something, the, teach, uh, the, uh, the pastor or others may teach you or uh, emphasize that you ought to cut this out, you ought to cut that out, and so on. And, uh, but the important thing is to get back, get back home and listen to him. And you can hear him say to you this and that, what you should cut out, you can, uh, so that some pruning should be done. There may be a lot of pruning that needs to be done. We may be impatient. Is impatience a sin? Well, you don't find impatience in heaven, do you? Nor, nor uh, heaven on earth. And uh, I have the, the conviction, maybe you don't, and... Uh, Maybe there are a lot of people that don't. But I have the conviction that one of the main things that Jesus came to do was to turn the world into heaven. Right now. So that we're living in heaven right here. In this area, in this uh, uh, time of our life. <coughs> and... Uh, and we can with his help so that all of our needs are taken care of and our hopes become realized. If you abide in me, what does that, what does that word abide mean anyway? <laughs> Why, it means that you carry the key in your own pocket and you don't have to wait for someone else to open the door and you don't have to ring the bell and somebody come and open the door for you. But you have the key in your own pocket. You go and come as you please. And uh, that's abiding. We abide in him. And uh, then what, does, what comes? When that season is, is, is over, if we want to use the same uh, illustration about uh, pruning in the orchard, why... Uh, when spring comes, then the sap within the trees or vines begins to, to flow and there come uh, the buds and the, the leaves and the fruit and uh, people can see it. Now what would happen if here in your city uh, there was one uh, uh, home that had some lovely fruit trees on the outside, which everybody can see. And those trees are covered with fruit, beautiful fruit. 
fruit that uh, is just out of this world in perfection. And people would come from far and wide to see your orchard. And uh, if they get a chance to talk with you, they'd uh, do their best to find out how it is that you have trees that bear such wonderful fruit. And if they have a place to plant trees, they'd want to get some of your trees, wouldn't they? That is that, your kind of trees. And plant them. Because your trees are an illustration of what they want. And our lives ought to be an illustration, of course, of what uh, the world wants. They ought to see. People ought to be coming to us right now. How is it that your prayers are answered? Your needs are met. Miracles happen. Why is it true? We go to church every Sunday. We read our Bibles. We have our quiet time with the Lord. But it doesn't happen to us. But wouldn't it be wonderful if, uh, if our lives revealed something a little bit different maybe than the average person's, the average Christian's life so that people would seek us out and, and ask us pointedly how it is that uh, we can go over all of our troubles, not to be empty of troubles, but how to meet our troubles and deal with our troubles. Wouldn't that be wonderful? And uh, that's one of the factors. And that's the way in which we prove to be his disciples. And uh, this Parsi lady, does it mean, she said, that we must be like you Christians? If so, we don't want it. And that's one of the reasons that I told the, told the missionaries when they came to us, what will we do? Well, you'll have to live it. It isn't a matter of just telling people. Some people use the word witness a good deal. I cringe when they do, usually, because they mean by witnessing going to somebody and urging that person to become a Christian or something like that, or um, uh, winning that person to Christ. Well, of course, I'm, I don't have anything against that. But uh, to me, that isn't what the word witness really means. And it's all right if they, for them to use the word in their own way, of course. But a real witness, in, uh, in my interpretation, is to, is to see the results of abiding in him. Being the person that we want this person to be like. We, we, we go as a witness. Maybe that's why more people don't ask more people why they, why they don't uh, go to church on Sunday. That's the way they'd start out probably. Well, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Have you any idea how many words in the New Testament that Jesus spoke? I don't, I don't have that figure, but I do have this figure. How many verses in the New Testament contain the quotations of Jesus? How many do you suppose there are? Because that's what he's talking about. If my words abide in you, yeah. We ought to know about, that, that is have some idea of, of uh, the words of Jesus in the Bible. Well, I got a hold of a, of a little book one time, just a little pocket book, containing the, the sayings of Jesus, all of them, in chronological order, <coughs> as they're found in the uh, New Testament. And incidentally, on one occasion, I gave a series of uh, sermons in my Chicago pulpit on the complete sayings of Jesus, beginning with the first one, 
Knew you not that I must be about my father's business? That's the first sentence. Then you go to the next sentence, and then the next, and so on. And uh, I, didn't, I, I didn't finish the series, but I, I spent several months on the series, and then other things interfered. So I had to do uh, some other things. But, um, ah. well, in the introduction to one of these little booklets that I was mentioning, Harry Emerson Fosdick, uh, made the statement that there are 1,599 verses in the New Testament containing the sayings of Jesus. Now, now you, you, you folks are too old to, uh, to recognize this, but if some young folks, if some kids were here, they'd, they'd pipe up and say, well, that's just one less than 1,600, and they wouldn't forget it. They'd remember it. Because 1,599 is just one less than 1,600. Now you can remember it, can't you? <laughs> and, uh, and if my words abide in you. Well, how can those words abide in you unless you know them? And you can't know them unless you read them. Now, this is so simple. It's silly for me to talk like this, maybe. But uh, it's as basic as that. And yet it isn't a matter of memorizing. Masha, how, 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 how much of the scripture did you memorize one time? She, me she, she uh, memorized chapter after chapter, whole sections. Tell, tell them how many you... I don't remember how many. <laughs> but it was Matthew 5, 6, and 7, every word of it. John 13, 14, 15, 17. Every word of it. Luke 15, Mark 6. Uh, then on into the other, but I'm just mentioning the part of the gospel. Yeah. And uh, if you want to enter onto a program yourself, uh, that would be, uh, I don't know anybody else that ever did such a thing as that, but I expect there are lots of them. When I was in the seminary, we had a man uh, come. Uh, he's written, uh, what was the name of that book? I ought to remember who, who he was. He's written a handbook. Maybe you, you remember, Mark, uh, a handbook on, uh, on the Bible, on the use of the Bible. Anyway, uh, huh? Haley? Kenny? Haley. Haley, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And he came to our seminary one time, and uh, it was announced before he spoke, that uh, he would recite any chapter or passage in the Bible that anybody wanted, him, wanted to hear. And uh, so student after student threw it out. And uh, in Old Testament and New Testament. And my gracious, if that man didn't stand there before us and recite chapter after chapter, did it rather rapidly too, so as to get in more chapters. And, uh, but the idea is not to memorize what Jesus has said, but to apply what he has said so that our lives are, are living the truth rather than our... We, we could repeat the truth, you see, word for word, without living it. And uh, the, the, the living is the, is the main thing. 1,599 verses containing the sayings of Jesus. I was up in Penang. I, you, you were with me at that occasion. Marsha's been with me most of the time. We've been together as we've gone around the world uh, oh, a lot of times. <clears throat> and uh, we were up in Penang. Penang is in the northern part of Malaysia. And some of you may, may not know where Malaysia is. It's that, it's that thing that sticks down like that uh, in Asia, uh, it used to be called, uh, well, Singapore is at the bottom of it. Does that help you to remember where, huh? Malaya. And it used to be called Malaya. Yeah. Malaya. And now it's called Malaysia. And over east of there, you see, uh, the islands of Indonesia. And 
I think we've been up at Penang a couple of times. And in a Methodist church there, a large, beautiful church. And, uh, and in the morning service, I remember the morning service, hundreds of people present. And uh, I made the statement that anyone could read the sayings of Jesus through in one afternoon if he had a red letter testament and just read the red letters, you see, verses, right straight through. He could do the whole thing in one afternoon. And that's one half of what Jesus says, and my words abide in you. And uh, I went on and continued preaching. And uh, in the evening, a young man came up to me, uh, about, about your age, and he came up and... Uh, he said, uh, I picked you up on what you said this morning. And after church, I went out and I bought a red letter testament. I don't know where he found it, but probably stores were open on Sunday afternoon. And uh, he, he bought a New Testament with the words of Jesus in red letters. You've all seen them. Probably you have them. And... Uh, and uh, and he timed himself, how long it would take him to read. And uh, I, I was all, all on edge because I'd never done it, you know. But I was making an assertion because I believed it was true that one could read them all in one afternoon. And uh, yes, he said it took me two and a half hours. Think of it. Now, here is the... Uh, an interesting factor. If one wants to become a great, a, a widely known historian in a certain area, he'll read lots of history. Read and read and read. Or if one wants to become a mechanic, he'll learn the laws of mechanics or astronomy or uh, chemistry. Why, well, one isn't a chemist unless he has studied a good deal. He goes to the college or university and reads and reads and reads and studies under instruction what he's read. So, so what he's read, so that he will become a wonderful chemist. And we think or I suppose that the average Christian thinks that it doesn't take any, any work in order to become an outstanding Christian, a real Christian. All we have to do is to believe. Now, that's one of the doctrines that we've promoted through the years. Just believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. Well, of course, the doctrine theologically is correct, but, uh, but it doesn't make a, uh, a living witness out of us. And we ought to be a living witness and apply what we've read and search our hearts. And tonight, I'm going to, um, and I hope that all of you, how many of you are from, uh, what is that, Correctionville? How many of you are here from Correctionville? One, two, two came. And the others of you belong to what? Cushing. Cushing. Nice, nice place to sit down, isn't it? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> nice and soft, huh? <laughs> well, tonight I hope you can come over there because I'll, I'll not be using this diagram here. And uh, I'm going to ask the pastor if he'll find a blackboard, if, I, if he can, for my use. And not, not a screen and, uh, and not something to throw on the ceiling or wall, but a blackboard. And, uh, and I will try to... Uh, indicate uh, by uh, symbolism, by diagram, the difference between the way in which uh, prayer is uh, shown in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And some people wouldn't know that there is any difference at all between prayer in the Old Testament and prayer in the New Testament. 
And, uh, but there's a difference. The way in which Jesus prayed and the way in which the Pharisees or the best people of the day prayed. There's a difference. And I'm going to try to diagram that on the board. You'll, you won't read this in any books that I know of. But uh, it's, the, it's my own, uh, uh, the thing that has come out of the years in which I have been uh, experimenting. And I've been experimenting. And, and you do too, folks. Don't be afraid of the, of the word experiment. Uh, use the word explore if you wish. If that will uh, uh, be a softer word to use. But uh, if this doesn't happen, try another way. You see? Experiment. If uh, your prayers are not answered, try the help of uh, asking your pastor to pray with you about it. That would be an experiment. Or the prayer group. Or this. Uh, try praying standing up. Or kneeling down. Try different ways. Experiment a little bit with your, uh, with your prayer life. Uh, not to to a great an extent, you know, but don't be afraid of it. Exploring. Well, <coughs> now what does it, what does it uh, involve? Here are 1,599 verses that Jesus tells us how to live as his followers and that his joy might be in us and that every need might be met and every desire in our heart fulfilled. Yeah. My, it's a wonderful promise. And you can read them all. Think of it. One, two and a half hours. Somebody says that's 150 minutes. 160 is it, well, well, you see, I didn't go to school. <laughs> 160 minutes. And yet in anything else, if you're going to achieve, you expect to study and study and study. And here's all you need is a little book. One book, maybe. And, uh, and uh, you can go all the way with Jesus. It is so simple. But if, uh, if, uh, if that works out, we must know what Jesus said. We must believe what Jesus said. We must love what Jesus said. And we must obey what Jesus says. Now, now Brother Nat, uh, there, there, there's an outline for a sermon you can preach to these folks and, and I won't have to take the time for it. <laughs> we must know what he says, believe what he says, love what he says, and obey what he says. And if a person uh, fits in to that schedule, I'll tell you the words are abiding in him. And... Um, now, when I was a youngster in high school, the teacher gave us an assignment to write a theme and to bring it back with us the, the next morning. This is in English. And uh, I thought that that was easy to do. We could write on any subject that we wished. Mm. What could be freer than that? And so uh, I didn't get after it very early that evening. <coughs> and, uh, but after a while, I realized I had to write that theme that night before I went to bed. And uh, what did I write on? You know, I couldn't think of, of anything to write about. I thought and thought. I scratched out all my hair. And, and um, I took that pencil or pen and squeezed it, but nothing would come out of it. I couldn't make it work. 
And uh, then I remembered that I had uh, confessed Christ as my Savior not very long before. And uh, I knew that, that some things were accomplished. I was, I'd been told or maybe read about it in the scriptures that, about prayer. And, uh, well, I'll pray about it. So I laid my pen down on the table and, uh, and said something like this. Now, Lord, you know I've got to write this theme and I've got to turn it in tomorrow morning and I don't know what to write about. So please tell me what to write about and help me to write this paper. Thank you, Lord. Amen. I made a very simple prayer, right to the point, something like that. And then I picked up my pen and put it down on the, on the first line where we used to write the topic sentence. Do you have topic sentences to get today in English composition? And, uh, well, I wrote the first sentence. And, uh, and then I wrote the second and the third. And I kept on, I couldn't stop writing. I couldn't stop writing. Now, I'm telling you the truth. Here was something that happened as a high school student. And uh, when it was over with, I went to bed. Now, usually, usually, I would have rewritten anything I'd written like that. So it's a turn in a neat paper, carefully written. But there wasn't time for it. I had to get some sleep and was late. And so I did something that was very unusual with me. I didn't rewrite it. I just folded it up, as we did in those days, and put my John Henry on it, and turned it in the next morning. Three days later, the teacher passed back our themes to us. She went around the classroom, tossing them onto the desks of the different, different ones, and uh, she tossed mine on my desk, and I looked at it, and there was something I'd never seen on one of my papers. A great big A in red ink. A, and then something after it, which to me was astounding. A plus sign. A plus. Well, I knew what it meant, even though I'd never had one before. <laughs> and, uh, and then I heard my name spoken. Now, Roland has the best theme. And I want him to read his theme to the class. And, and I did. I remember only one or two words in that, but, but one word was Empyrean. Mm. I got one big, big shot. <laughs> and I thought that was wonderful. This was before the First World War. And my theme was dealing with warfare in the skies. Mm. with airplanes and how warfare, I, this, this sentence was the one that got her, I think, that warfare had become revolutionized in the Empyrean. <laughs> and uh, so I was, I was thrilled. Well, I was in, uh, let's see, down in the Congo. We don't call it that now. What's the name of the Congo now? Don't you know? Zaire? Isn't that it? Yeah. Zaire. And uh, you, you see, the Congo was a, a uh, Belgium name. That is a Holland, Dutch. And uh, so they, um, they call most of the countries around the world, or a great many of the countries around the world, their names have been changed to the, uh, the name that the country that did the colonizing gave, and now they're use, using uh, names out of their own vocabulary. And, uh, well, what was I saying, Masha? I was down uh, in, in the Congo, 
Now, why did I ever mention the Congo? <laughs> uh, and, um, oh yes, I was uh, in a high school with uh, all black students. And uh, I used this illustration of uh, praying about this, uh, this theme and how I squeezed the pen <laughs> and it wrote right out of the end of the pen. And uh, the, um, the missionary who was interpreting for me told me that he didn't interpret it that way. <laughs> Because those fellows really believe that you buy, you buy, uh, you buy a pen to, to do your work. That it, that it comes from the flow of the, right from the pen. You don't have to have any brains about anything. You just buy the pen and, and that's it. And they think that, uh, that a pair of glasses, you buy a pair of glasses and then uh, you can see. Other, huh? Yeah. That's really. And, uh, oh, we have strange ideas. Uh, the, uh, the interpreters uh, get us fixed up right. <laughs> they help us to avoid saying things that we ought not to, uh, to, to say. Um, yeah. So uh, that's, that's that. Now, are there any questions any of you would like to ask? If you... Continue in my word. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you may ask for anything that you wish and it will be granted. My, what a sweeping promise. Now, those are the words of Jesus. Yeah. What, uh, what greater thing could a person do than to read what Jesus says. Now, some people think, uh, think that memorizing is the, is the answer. And uh, there, are, there are groups that uh, help people to memorize. One is located in uh, Colorado. And uh, that's, uh, that's nice. They have uh, scripture passages that they send out for people to memorize. Wonderful. But, uh, and if you want to do it that way, fine. But you don't have to. Become familiar with what Jesus said. That's that, uh, that sentence, for instance, that you are going to memorize. You don't have to memorize it. But let it become a part of you. That's more important than memorizing. If, it, if you memorize it, it may be just in your head. You see? But uh, let, let it get right down into your being so that it becomes a part of you. It, it is you. And uh, then marvelous things begin happening. So I'm not suggesting that you memorize. No questions? All right. Um, let me tell you something about Bill. And then we'll have a have a, a laboratory session for a few minutes. Bill, he never came to church, but, but he was a, a fine fellow. He had a nice family, and they all came to church regularly. Very, very fine Christi Christian home. And the father believed all right, and, uh, but, but he didn't come to church. Like the others did. Well, it made, it made the family unhappy and sorrowful and, and the pastor. And uh, then he came down with a dreadful disease. The doctor told him that he had cancer of the bladder. And that if he didn't do exactly as the doctor said, he would be a dead man in two weeks. Well, that put the fear of God into his heart. And immediately they sent for me. And I walked into the room where he was uh, lying in bed. And uh, the minute he saw me, he said, Oh, Pastor, pray for me. Please pray for me. I don't want to die. I can't die. I mustn't die. I've got to live for my family. 
And uh, he was so emphatic about it. I pulled up a chair and sat down beside the bed, looked into his eyes, and uh, I said, Bill, you, you say that as though you meant it. Well, I do mean it. And uh, I never met anything more, uh, more in my life. And I said, well, then I'll ask you one question. Now, I didn't cook this up. It just came on the spot. I'd never said it before. I've never said it since. But it evidently needed to be said at the time. I take it that the Holy Spirit put the words onto my lips. I said, Bill, do you think that God thinks that you're worth saving? He said, oh, Pastor, I never, I never meant anything more in all my life than that. And I said, well, you speak as though you really mean it. And therefore, I can pray with you with power. And uh, I don't know why I said that. I don't know if I ever said that before. Because even that isn't in my vocabulary. And uh, he said, I never meant anything more, more than that. And so uh, he closed his eyes. And I prayed a little prayer. And, uh, and left. Two weeks later, instead of their bringing him into the church in, uh, in a box, he walked in on his own two feet. And, uh, and he came to every service of the church. Every time the doors were open, he was there. And he was so sincere about his new church fellowship that uh, nothing interfered with that. He listened to all the radio programs. And in those days, the radio, but that was before TV, the radio programs, uh, there were a lot of, uh, there was a lot of religious material on the, on the radio. In, in, this was in Chicago, of course. And uh, lots of programs, and he was listening to a lot of it. And he read more in the Bible in the next two weeks than he'd ever read before in his life. And the, uh, he began coming every time the, the, anything was doing at the church. And then the, the church, uh, because he'd become so faithful and so dependable, they made him a trustee. And we never had a trustee in that church. Now, our trustee, I don't know how you run your churches, but a trustee in our church uh, had responsibility of the building and everything about the building. And uh, the, uh, the material things of the church. And uh, they made him a trustee. And, and if anything needed doing about that church, I tell you, that fellow was on the job. If a window needed repairing, you know, why well, it'd be done quickly. One day, I overheard him saying to a stranger to me, but he knew who he was, who was going by the church on the sidewalk. He, uh, and he said, uh, "Why don't you come to church? Look at me. See what's see what God has done for me." Yeah. And uh, so he was a living witness. And. So, uh, God healed him of that cancer of the bladder. He uh, had the periodic examinations that go along with that disease for years, but he outlived everything. Folks, God is good. Jesus is wonderful. Don't you think so? Amen. He is. And we've just begun to uh, work at it. I can't, I can't give you a, 
and in any of the meetings that follow, I can only uh, bring uh, help, encouragement, enthusiasm, uh, illustrations, things like that, that will inspire. But uh, you've got to do the job. I can't do it for you. There isn't any uh, secret formula that, that we can memorize. <laughs> There's no magic to prayer. Not a bit. And uh, many of your prayers are not answered even after you pray, you know. And I never know when a prayer is going to be answered or not. And, and I don't make any inquiries. And, uh, and I never ask anybody what the outcome was that I had prayed for. If I prayed for somebody, I wouldn't have gone back to Bill, for instance, and asked how, uh, if, uh, if the prayer did him any good. See? I never asked. And uh, if they tell me, that's all right. That's wonderful. And the reason for that, probably, is because it's none of my business. That's God's business. And uh, so I leave that to God. So <clears throat> there isn't any question, maybe, that is asked us more frequently than the question, well, why weren't our prayers answered? Well, we need to search our own hearts, of course, and see if, if we're living on the beam, if we're doing what the Lord says, if we're abiding in him, and his truth is abiding in us. Uh, and uh, that's all right. But uh, the, the answer to a prayer is in the realm of God. And so you don't need to be, be at all wondering about it, except, that, except as to the kind of a person that you are. If you don't take time alone with him, I'll draw a picture of where you can go tonight. And... Uh, <laughs> and uh, <what? laughs> and uh, if you if you do take time to grow in grace, then you'll discover miracles happen in your own life that will amaze you. And. Uh, but I'm not going to hold out any promises to you, except a promise like that. As you grow in grace, with him living in you, and his words living in you. Uh -huh. All right. Have I covered everything, Marsha, that I should say? Should I quit? <laughs> she says... sitting in a straight up position and uh, don't be holding on to anything. Now, now you, some of you are... Huh? Yeah. Yes, put things on the floor if you need to <coughs> so that you can sit more or less erect. And, uh, and look at me for a moment. I'm going to raise my shoulders and uh, see how easy that is? Now let go of them, you see. Now, uh, many people go around with their shoulders up in the air like that. I've, I've stood on a street corner and watched people pass by, and sometimes you can, you can see the tensions in their bodies, as you, see, as you see the tensions in my hands. Walking down the street, so tense. There are some people that seem to be tense all the time. And that tension may bring on all kinds of, different kinds of diseases. I won't say all kinds, but many different kinds of diseases. Because probably that, that tension reveals uh, that you're not trusting as much as you are. Uh, maybe, maybe afraid, fear. And uh, many of our conditions, our physical conditions and sicknesses, come uh, from, uh, from uh, worry. And uh, I arrived at Le Varden one time up on the north, northern coast of uh, Holland. And a man came up to me 
who was a physician, a doctor. He said, Roland Brown, I want you to spend as much time with me as you can. I want to learn as much as I can about uh, psychosomatic medicine. <laughs> And I know you know a lot about it, <laughs> and I didn't, although I, I, knew, I knew some things. And uh, he said, nothing is printed in Dutch in the area of psychosomatics. And I have 4,000 uh, patients who have uh, diseases and conditions caused by worry and, uh, what was the other word? Worry and uh, huh? fear, maybe. Fear, maybe. Uh, two simple words, uh, two simple uh, conditions. And, and he says, I don't have any pills to give for worry and uh, whatever that was. <laughs> and, uh, but that's, that's true. A lot of sickness comes from worry. Resentment, fear, and things of that nature. The emotions. And uh, we ought to get our emotions under control. And when we do, we are apt to be in better physical condition than otherwise. Well, now sit more or less erect, with your hands in your laps, not uh, holding on to anything. And drop your shoulders, close your eyes, and drop your shoulders. That means that your elbows go, go down lower. <coughs> now just let go of all the tension in your shoulders. And let it flow down into the arms. And clear way down to your shoes. Just <laughs> relaxing all over. Now open your eyes. Now that wasn't difficult to do, was it? You can do, do that any time you want to. Well, if you begin a prayer period in your home, alone with God, to spend a few minutes with your Bible, or a longer time with your Bible, and, uh, and uh, reading and praying, uh, oftentimes you are worried about things. Things are on your mind. You're tense. So start in. Instead of uh, immediately reading or praying, uh, start in by relaxing like we've just done. Take a few moments and just let go of all the tensions in the body. And uh, That is very, very beneficial. Now close your eyes again. And have a yearning in your heart to be filled with the love of God. You don't have to use any particular words, just a desire in your heart to be filled with his love. Now I heard Frank Lawbach say one time, God never created us to be a bucket to be filled with love. So knock the bottom out of the bucket. That's what he said. 
He made us to be a channel for love. So let his love right now flow through you to the person sitting at your left. That uh, in your imagination, if you want to do it this way, <coughs> imagine it coming down from above, right down upon you, flowing right through you to the person sitting beside you at the left. And now do it with the one at your right. And think of somebody back home. Maybe they're in school right now. Or at work. Wherever they are. Maybe not in this city, but some other city. Just some loved one. And let the love of God, which has come down from above into your heart, flow out to them. It really means, of course, that you are, are wanting God to bless them, and He's doing it. As you turn in thought to them, and His love is coming right down upon you and flowing through you to them. Now think about this community. On all, about all the, the families that live in this community. You may know some families that are in great need. And you want to help them. You want to bless them. Let God's love flow through you to them. You don't have to use any words. But you can if you wish. You can say, Lord, bless them. Meet every need in their lives. Fix them up, Lord. You know how to do it. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Now open your eyes. You want to speak about that for a moment? What happened? Well, I was thinking of one of our sons that's in college. Yeah? And I could see like I was a stovepipe and there was a corner and the love was flowing out or it was from South Dakota. Yeah? Wonderful. Anybody else? Did you think of somebody? You did, huh? Well, I don't want to embarrass any of you by, by saying we're all of the same blood. <laughs> I had trouble in concentrating on one person. Huh? I had trouble in concentrating on one person. Oh, it went out to many, huh? It went out, yes. Wonderful. It went in one direction as well as another. Yeah. Well, that's lovely. Well, that's a very simple exercise that you can do any time you want to. Walking down the street or at home, or after you go to bed at night. Just allow yourself to be filled with His love, and then just let that love flow out from you. And uh, in your imagination, you can sort of direct that love. Uh, that's all right. I don't know how you can do it without uh, imagining it. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. And I don't feel. Well, I know that isn't necessary, but I say, what? Well, I, that's wonderful. And yet, it isn't necessary. I know. It isn't, it isn't necessary. A lot of people have feelings. Master, talk to that for a moment. They <laughs> <laughs> <I> sure do. <laughs> The 
the simplest way to talk to it is we don't live by feelings, we live by faith. Yeah. Know it, whether you feel it or not. Yeah. If you have made yourself available to him, he is using you. You can guarantee on that. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. Well, well if, if the day comes when you <coughs> need to feel it, you will. So don't worry about it. <laughs> Some people emphasize that. And Blessed are they which uh, believe even that they haven't felt. Yeah. Okay. Back to Thomas. There are people who multitudes of people that never have a chance. Uh, Thomas did. Thomas had a need. And the Lord stepped in and met that need. But blessed are those who believe that haven't seen. I had this little formula given to me one time that it's a fact that it happens. It's a, a, a fact. Well, then we have to have faith. And then maybe afterwards we'll get to be mm -hmm. Anybody else? I was wondering if that means that those that do feel it, are they not blessed then? <laughs> I don't know how they can help but be blessed. <laughs> But we can have the blessing without... Yeah, feeling. I go along with that. Uh, yeah. So that if you're relying just on the feeling uh, so often, if the feeling doesn't come, you're thrown for a loss. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, of course, puts you out of circulation, mm -hmm. in a way, for a while until things get fixed up again. And we don't have to have that kind of assurance. Right. We have a different kind of assurance yeah. when I, he is using us. I find many times with myself, I go into periods where I do feel alone and maybe even lost a mm bit, -hmm. but every time I come back with a growth that is a blessing that I've never had before. But every time I, mm -hmm. I do it. Wonderful. All right. Well, now, um, sit erect again uh, and be relaxed all over. <laughs> and uh, think of uh, different areas of the United States. And have a yearning in your heart, just as a desire that the Lord may bless certain individuals or places like the president and uh, we can ask the Lord in our hearts or just think of it as the love of God flowing over to the White House. Blessing Him. And now you can mention uh, certain other countries if you wish. Some gentlemen were getting some peace prizes today, weren't they? Or yesterday? So, you can let God's love flow out to wherever they are. And the situation in the Middle East. You can do this without using words. You can use the words if you want to, but you don't have to. You can take the whole Middle East, for instance, and bring it right into your heart. Do it with your imagination. And let God's blessings flow out from you to people there. Now you can mention out loud some area of the world where we can do this. Kentucky where the disaster flood now. Yes. Some other place. To the refugees in the boats and take it to the 
there. And another? Rhodesia. Yes. And as we do things of this nature, uh, the best way probably is to try not to think of the unpleasant things, the negative things, but try to make it all positive. If the negative things come, just switch to some positive, and that'll be easy. So, Lord, we ask you to bless the whole world because that's what you want to do. It's your great desire. And you told us to pray, may thy kingdom come on earth just as it is in heaven. So we ask you, Lord, to turn the world into heaven. And... Uh, Make everyone happy and to love you, to go all the way in trying to obey you. May thy will be done on earth, Lord, as it is in heaven. We ask it for your sake and for your glory. Amen.